Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A Level, Chemistry Unit 5 for May 2021. This is Section B. I will put the link to Section A of this paper as well as Section C in the description box. So let's begin with the first question. Question 18 says this question is about manganese compounds. Some that are given below. So here we have the reduction potentials of compounds of manganese as well as iron. So we will begin with the first part. It says write the ionic equation for the disproportionation of manganate, six ions, in acidic conditions using relevant half equations from the table. So what we have to know is uh, here when they ask about disproportionation of these, because this is manganate 6, if it's disproportionating, it means it's being oxidized and reduced at the same time. To oxidize manganate 6, it means you are converting it to manganate 7. And to reduce manganate 6, it means you are converting it to either manganese 2 or manganate, manganese 4. So what we need to do is we need to look for equations involving conversion of Manganese, manganate 6 to manganate 7, which is this one. Equation 1 covers that. However, we also have to look for another equation involving acidic conditions. And again, they've said acidic conditions. So here, 1 should involve acidic conditions. And since here we have an equation involving this, it is going directly to this. There is no equation involving manganese 6 going to manganese 2. So we're going to use this one here because it's the one involving manganate 6, converting it to manganese 4. So using this equation and that equation, we can see that this reduction potential is really high in comparison to that. And another thing, so we, what we have to do is we're going to reverse equation 1. Because for equation 1 to occur, it is the manganate 6 that is going to be releasing, uh, releasing electrons to be converted into manganate 7. And then this is going to be reacting to produce that. So when we combine the two equations, and again, another thing we have to know, since two electrons are involved here, we have to multiply that equation by two to ensure that the generated electrons are two as well. So I multiplied by two here to show you in the right color and then combine the two equations. So this equation here has to be reversed, as I can, uh, you can see here. I said multiply by 2, and then we had to reverse equation 1. So reversing equation 1 to make sense of what reactants we have to use based on the redox potentials, and then combining the two, I get 3 manganate 6s, 4H+, and then on the other side I have 2 manganate 7, uh, 1 manganese 4, and then I have water. So this is the overall equation we were looking for here. I will continue to the next part. They say calculate the ether cell for the disproportionation of manganese 6 ions, uh, manganese 6 ions in acidic conditions, stating whether or not the reaction is thermodynamically feasible. So here what we have to see is remember, the one that is being oxidized has to be on the left, while that being reduced has to be on the right. Since this is going to be, uh, this one here is going to be the oxidation reaction, it means we're going to put it on the, on, the, on, the, on the left, and this one that is being reduced is going to be on the right. So the equation for calculating the E theta for the cell is E theta for the right half cell minus the E theta for the left half cell. If you go back to the table, because this one is using up electrons, this one here is going to be on the right. Sorry, let me use a, a thinner pen. Mm, give me a minute. So this one here is going to be on the right. It's using up the electrons while this is going to be reversed. And then on the left. So we can say the E theta for the cell is going to be 2.26 minus 0 0.56, which gives us a positive 0 1.70. .7, one thing you have to know is you have to put the positive sign and you have to put the unit. And you have to make sure that the significant figure, figures make sense based on the information given from the table. Again, to summarize, it's positive 1.70 volts. And the conclusion here, they say it's stating whether or not the reaction is thermodynamically feasible. This reaction is thermodynamically feasible because the E theta for the cell is positive. So let's continue to the next part. Here, the part says, using the standard electrode potentials in the table, assess the thermodynamic feasibility of preparing manganate 6 by reacting manganese 7 and manganese 4 oxide in alkaline conditions. 
Since here we are reacting manganese 7, manganese 7 and manganese 4 oxide, we have to make sure the suitable conditions we choose are putting the two on the reactant side, and we have to make sure the equation involves alkaline conditions. So from the table, I saw that equation 1 and equation 2 meant uh, basically we're going to be, they will give us what we're looking for. Again, to take you back slowly, we have equation 1 and equation 2. As you see, these are the ones we're going to use. And we have to ensure that what is on the, on the left-hand side, based on the equation, is going to be on the reactant side. And uh, we will reverse the equations uh, responsibly to ensure that the reactants are on the same side. So you can see this one here. I have left it as it was, a reduction equation. However, this one here was reversed. The reason for that is to ensure that manganese 4 is on the left side, at the reactant side, and we have the alkaline conditions here they talked about. So combining the two, we can, basically these are the two equations we're gonna, we're gonna get out of um, the table. So we have to multiply through to ensure that the electrons are the same. I multiply through by two to, to, to generate, to be able to have two electrons, the same electrons that are given away here. So the E theta for the cell is going to be E right minus E left, which is 0 0.56 minus 0 0.59. And the resultant is going to be negative 0 0.03 volts. Remember to always put the sign and put the units. So remember the conclusion here, the question is asking us to use the, uh, the standard electrode potential in the table and assess the thermodynamic feasibility of preparing that. So we have to assess the feasibility. The one thing we see here is the E theta cell value is negative. So because it's negative, we would say that it's not feasible. However, it's a small negative value. Because it's a small negative value, you have to tell the examiner the E theta value is small but negative since the electrode potential values are too close. This value here and that value are too close, making a negative answer that is going to be really small. So the final part we can see is this reaction will be feasible only if the concentration of the alkali is increased or using a concentrated alkaline solution, the reaction is going to be feasible because remember, the alkali is on the reactant side. If we increase the concentration of these, it means the, the collisions are going to be more successful and this equilibrium is going to be drawn to the product side, be, making the reaction basically feasible. I will continue to the next part. B. Still is an alloy of iron and carbon. A group of students determine the iron content of a sample of steel wire by a titration method. So a known mass of the wire was dissolved in dilute sulfuric acid and the resulting solution made up to 250 cm cubed with more dilute sulfuric acid and mixed thoroughly. So it means in this case, we are making a standard solution, of course, in a volumetric flask by using the iron Found in the steel, reacting it with the acid. So the product here is going to be iron 2 plus in the solution. So the 250 centimeters cube solution is a iron sulfate or iron 2 plus. So they continue. From this solution, they took 25 centimeters cube sample of the resulting solution were titrated with 0 0.0195 mole per decimeter cube potassium manganate 7 solution. They say that the color change at the end of the titration. Uh, the color change should be from colorless to pale pink. Let us see. If this is the conical flask we have, in this conical flask, initially we will have iron 2 plus, and then we're going to have the acid in here. Then from the burette, we're going to have the potassium manganate or manganate 7 uh, that is going to be dropping into the burette. However, as the manganese 7 drops into the burette, it's going to be converted into manganese 2 plus. Now, a combination of all these two in the solution is going to be colorless. The reason as to why it's colorless is because there are very few moles of each, so it's going to be so dilute that it's almost colorless. However, do not get this wrong. Manganese 2 in concentrated solution is not colorless, and iron in concentrated solution is not colorless. The reason as to why they are colorless in this situation is because of the very dilute concentration in, it, in which it is. Now, at the end of this titration, an extra drop of the purple potassium manganate 7 is going to drop into this colorless solution, and as a result, we're going to get a pale pink color. So when they ask, the color change is going to be from colorless to pale pink. As I have demonstrated here, the next part says, one student chooses 1.53 grams of the wire, weighed directly on the balance band, and obtain a mean titer of 27.35 centimeters cubed. 
They ask, using half equations 3 and 5 from the table, calculate the percentage of iron in the steel wire and give your answer to three significant figures. So from the table, we had reduction potentials. So the equation for iron was iron 3 plus uh, plus 1 electron to give us iron 2 plus. They were all reduction potentials. However, when you compare these two, in this reaction, it should be iron 2 reacting with manganate 7. So to fit this situation, I have to reverse this equation so that it is written as this. Iron 2 gives us iron 3 plus plus an electron. And also, when you look here, you can see these electrons are 5. So I have to multiply everything here by 5 to ensure that 5 electrons are going to be generated from 5 moles of iron 2 in order for 1 mole of manganate, sorry, in order for 1 mole of manganate to use up this. Uh, give me a minute. Let me correct this. In order for 1 mole of manganate to use up that, and produce manganese too. So we can see five electrons generated here are going to be used here so that the reaction can be completed. And when we combine these two equations, again, sorry, I don't know why the eraser keeps coming on. When we combine these two equations, we get a general equation, which is this. So from my general equation and referring to the information given, like they've told us the concentration used here, they've given us the volume used, I place them below the information so that I can be able to make the calculation as required. So the first part I did is to find the number of moles of manganate because the information of manganate 7 is given to me, which is concentration times volume. So here it's going to be 0 0.0195 times the volume, which is 27.35. However, I divided by 1,000 to convert this volume to decimeters cubed, and then my answer comes out as that. The next part is to look at the equation. This is the general equation. Since I have the number of moles of these, to get the number of moles of these, I have to multiply 5 times since the mole ratio of manganate to iron 2 is 1 to 5. I multiply these moles by 5 to get the moles of this, which is what I've done here. But these moles are in 25 centimeters cubed because these are the moles that reacted. They were the ones in the conical flask. Next, we need to find the moles of iron 2 in the 250. Remember the steel was dissolved in the 250 centimeters cubed solution of the acid, and that means that is how we have to find the moles that were originally present. So I, I can multiply the moles in 25 by 10 to get the moles. So the moles in 25 times 10, I'll get the moles in 250. This is basically scaling up. And then lastly, I use these moles in, two, in 250 and the mass to find the, 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 of course, to be able to find the mass moles and the molar mass to find the mass. So to find the mass of iron in steel, it's going to be the moles in the 250 times the molar mass of iron, and that will give me this mass. And finally, the percentage of iron in the wire should be the mass of iron in the, in the wire divided by the mass of wire times 100, which gives me 97.3%. I uh, rounded off to three significant figures. So I will continue to the next part of the question. A second student carried out the same experiment but used distilled water to make up the solution in the volumetric class. A bronze suspension formed during the titration. Explain how, if at all, the tidal value would be affected by the student's error. So here I can begin with a demonstration. Let's see. Remember, we are trying to explain why there is a bronze thing. So this bronze suspension should be due to formation of manganese 4 that is going to be brown. So since we are trying to convert manganate 7 to, of course, those should be double arrows, but let me just use one arrow. Uh, manganese 7, manganate 7 to manganese. Uh, it could be manganese 2 plus, or it could be manganate 7 to manganese 4. One thing we need to know is here, we need 5 electrons per mole of manganate. Well, here we need 3 electrons per mole of manganate. So let me use a different color. To provide those electrons, remember we have a constant volume of iron three, so iron two in the uh, in the conical flask. That is going to be iron two. Again, I drew, I didn't draw it like a conical flask, but imagine it's like conical flask. We have iron two plus in here. So since we have 25 centimeters cubed, they contain the same electrons. Whether you 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 add here the manganate seven to produce either when you add manganese 7 to produce manganese 2 or manganese 4 this is going to be constant in here 
whatever is in here is going to be constant. The total electrons to be given out from here are going to be exactly the same. So it means if you use the manganate that uses up more electrons, you're going to use a less volume in comparison to if you use uh, the manganate giving you manganate manganese 4. Again, I want to iterate. If you are using magnet 7 to convert it to magnet 2, more electrons are going to be required. Therefore, they're, they're going to use up this, this amount really fast using a less volume of magnet 7. However, if you are converting from magnet 7 to magnet 4, fewer electrons are going to be required per mole. It means you will need to use more moles so that all these moles of, all these electrons in here are going to be used up. I hope you guys understand this. So here I say, the brown suspension is due to formation of manganese 4 from manganese 7. And based on the table of redox potentials, the conversion of manganese 7 to manganese 2 requires 5 electrons, while the conversion of manganese 7 to manganese 4 requires 3 electrons. This is very important. So we would assume that if you are forming the bronze suspension, you are going to require a larger volume since the bronze suspension, which is manganese 4, is created when fewer electrons are used up per mole of manganate. So it means we will need to use more moles of manganate in order to use up all the electrons. Again, the key thing is in these two things here. I hope everybody understands them. And for extra explanation, I wrote something here that can help you understand further. Please revisit it. So we go to the next part. It says, the uncertainties of the apparatus used in the experiment are shown below. So we have that in the balance, the burette, the pipette, and the volumetric class. And they ask the percentage uncertainty on the value measure. So basically, they gave us a question about completing the table, and they gave us one result. One thing we need to know is if they ask you to calculate the percentage uncertainty, you need to know the uncertainty in each reading. In this case, we have the uncertainty, and we know how many times the balance is. The balance is going to be read twice. The burette is read twice or measured twice. You check it twice. The pipette once and the volumetric class once. So in this case, I will say two times times the uncertainty. So two times the uncertainty divided by the measured value, everything in brackets, times 100 gives you that. In here, we'll say since the BRH is read twice, 2 times 0 0.05 divided by 27.35, everything in the brackets times 100 gives you that. And then the pipette, which is read once, uh, so it's going to be 1 times plus or minus 0 0.06 divided by the measured value 25, everything in brackets times 100 giving us that. And the volumetric flux will be 1 times plus or minus 0 0.3 divided by 250, everything in brackets times 100 giving us that. So the next question says, a student uh, obtained the value of 95.863 for the proportion of iron in the wire. State whether or not this student has given their answer to an appropriate number of significant figures and justify your answer in terms of total percentage uncertainty. So here to get the first mark, you have to add up the total percentage uncertainty, which is 0 0.65 plus 0 0.37 plus 0 0.24 plus 0 0.12, giving us a 1.36%. Again, remember, this is percentages, so that's percent. Then the other part is asking you whether the student has followed the, the right number of significant figures. So here we have to know that the, the significant figures have to be more than two, since this value here, 1.36%, is actually much bigger than 0 0.863. Another approach we could use is rounding off. Let's take an example. You could begin by rounding off from this, rounding off to 95.86. Or you could round it off to 95.9. Or even somebody could round it off to 96. All this rounding off, every time you round off, you're going to increase the error, the error basically. However, I followed here that when I round off from this point to this point here, and I calculate the change I've got. Of course, 95.863 minus 95.9 gives you this value here. And that value divided by the, the calculated obtained value from the student times 100 gives me this value. So it means if I round off from 95.86 to 95.9, the error in my rounding off is 0.039%. And this is kind of insignificant. It's an ineligible value. You could choose to leave it. And if you try to round off maybe to 96, if you use 96, you could say also 96 minus 95.86. Let me do my calculator really fast. Minus 95.86. Uh, it gives me a 0 
and then 0 0.14 I can divide by 95.863 giving me uh, okay that value I've got here if I multiply by 100 it gives me a 0 0.146 which may not be insignificant therefore rounding off to a closer value is going to be not right but I could round off to 95.86 or 95.9 and the difference is not going to be that great so this brings us to the end of question 18 let's move on to question 19. question 19 this question is about the investigation of an organic compound x x is a liquid at room temperature and pressure which turns dumb red litmus paper blue so if it turns dumb red litmus paper blue it should be a base remember they've told it's a liquid so it should be alkaline or base in nature the first part says name the functional group present in X. If it's a liquid and not a gas and it turns damp red litmus paper blue, yet they've told us it's an organic compound, that should be an amine. So I say it's an amine. Remember, it's organic. It turns damp red litmus paper blue and it's a liquid. It should be an amine. So the next part says when 0 0.493 grams of X was vaporized, 157 centimeters cubed of dry air was displaced. Uh, measured at 15 degrees Celsius and 103000 pascals. So they say calculate the molar mass of X using the ideal gas equation. Here what we have to know is you have to convert the, the volume, the temperature and pressure into the required units. Volume has to be in meters cubed, temperature has to be in Kelvin and pressure has to be in pascals. So I began by converting volume. We divide by 10 power 6 to convert it to meters cubed. And then the temperature is 15 degrees. We add 273 to convert it to Kelvin. And then the pressure is already given in Pascal, so there is no need to convert. Now, the other part for this equation, PV is NRT, is N. So we have not found the value for N. But remember, they told us to find the molar mass. So we know number of moles is going to be mass divided by the molar mass. So it means we have to work with that. So I say PV is nrt we make n the subject which gives us that however the number of moles is mass divided by molar mass i substituted this in place of n and i then made the molar mass the subject so i had this then i just substituted in the mass is given 0 0.493 we have the r 8.31 this value can be given or not you have to memorize it and then temperature is 288 or you could look at your data booklet for that it's gonna be there pressure is here and the volume is that multiplying everything I got this and I converted it to three significant figures which is 73.0 gram per mole remember we were looking for molar mass it's easy to do the next part says x reacts vigorously with ethanol chloride forming steamy fumes now when you hear steamy fumes and you hear a chloride when there is a chloride reacting with something to form steamy fumes of course that could should be HCl so this is ethanol chloride are reacting with X to form uh, steamy fumes. So this is telling us it could be a substitution reaction. Maybe we remember we said X is an amine. If it's an amine, this is going to be a nucleophilic substitution reaction and the product is going to be an N substituted amide. So an amine reacts with an acyl chloride. Of course, an amide is going to be produced and HCl gas is going to be from the other side. So they say identify the steamy fumes by name of formula. This is HCl gas. And again, how did I know it's HCl? There is chlorine. It's an ethanol chloride reacting with an amine. Remember, you have already known that in X, there is an amine functional group. It should be HCl gas that comes off. And then the next part says, suggest the functional group present in Y. Remember, Y is the product. It has an N-substituted amide. Uh, don't just say amide. Just say, you have to say N-substituted amide, although it's an amide. The next part says analysis of Y shows that its compound a composition by mass is 62.6% carbon, 11.3% hydrogen, and 12.2% nitrogen. Finally, 13.9% oxygen. Determine the empirical formula of Y. You must show your working. Here, we have to position the carbon, the hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen separately. We put the individual percentages by mass as given. And then we can divide the mole number, find the number of moles by dividing through by the atomic mass of each. And then these are the number of moles. And then we divide through by the smallest number of moles to find the whole number ratio. So the ratio was a 6 to 13 to 1 to 1. And gives, this gives me this equation here as the empirical formula for this. 
So let us continue to the next page. A simplified high resolution proton NMR spectrum of Y is uh, shown. The relative peak areas are given near each peak. So when we look at this uh, NMR peak, we can see, or spectrum, sorry, we can see there is a, a one peak here, another one here, and another one here. And since they've told us it's high resolution, we can see that they are all singlets. So they are all singlets. And we see the proton ratio in this environment. There is one proton here, there are three, and that is nine. The ratio is one to three to nine. And now we can see the chemical shifts down here. So each is positioned at a specific chemical shift. So the question is asking us to deduce the structure of Y using the NMR spectrum and uh, other information in the question. So let's see. So I said there are three peaks. This indicates three different proton environments. I think you can see peak one, peak two, and peak three. That is three environments. And then remember this, this is high resolution. So I said all are singlets, and this shows that there are no adjacent protons. Since all are singlets, no adjacent protons. And remember, we know there is a, this is going to be an amide. There is going to be three different proton environments. So we have to know uh, that uh, this is going to be, since it's, they're all singlets, there should be no adjacent protons on the nearby carbons. Then we see the peak area, which is a uh, three to one to three to nine to three to one. This indicates that there are nine protons in one environment. Another environment has three and another environment has one proton respectively. And then we can see that the nine protons, nine protons are always going to be indicative of this. If there are nine protons in one environment, this is indicative that there is a carbon connected to three CH3s in that specific environment. So that makes sense. And lastly, I went to the chemical shift. There is a chemical shift at 7 ppm. This, if you look at your data booklet, is going to indicate a proton in the nitrogen hydrogen. That proton is indicated by that. Then there is another chemical shift at 2 ppm, and this will indicate the hydrogen, carbon, carbon, oxygen, double bond, like the way this is in this group. And then lastly, we can predict the structure. Remember, we had this group here, and we know it's going to be an amide. Therefore, if we have this group here, and remember again, they're all singlets. So if this is one environment, that is a neighboring environment here, and the other environment, so this is sing singlet because the near, nearby carb carbon has no, uh, no hydrogen. And this one here, no hydrogen in the neighborhood. And this one here, there are no hydrogens on the nearby carbon. So they are all singlet. So this structure is the only one that is satisfies uh, that whatever they talked about in this question. And therefore, I say the structure of Y should be this. They are all singlets. We have nine protons in this, in this environment, one here and three here. We have, uh, of course, there are three protein environments, and you see they're all singlets. So that makes sense based on the question. Let's go to the final part. They say draw the structure of compound X. Remember, compound X is the amine that reacted with the, uh, with the acyl chloride. And again, let me take you back. They told you it was an acyl chloride, ethanol, ethanol chloride. So if it was ethanol chloride, you already knew this structure. It means the other part should be coming from somewhere else. So that these three, uh, three CH3s wouldn't have been part of the acyl chloride if they told you it was ethanol chloride. Again, to take you back slowly a little bit, they told you it was ethanol chloride. So the three CH3s must have been from the amine, not ethanol chloride. So let me move back forward slowly to take you to the end. So it means the other part should be what we have here, the CH3, 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 and NH2. That was the amine you're looking for. This brings us to the end of question 19. Uh, let's move on to question 20. Question 20. This question is about benzene and some related compounds. So some, some standard enthalpies of combustion are shown below. Here we have the specific standard enthalpies. This is for cyclohexene. This is for cyclohexa 1 for diene, and this is for benzene. They are shown here. So the first question asks, using the standard enthalpies of combustion of cyclohexene and cyclohexa 1 for diene, calculate a value for the enthalpy of combustion of the theoretical compound cyclohexa 1, 3, triene. Again, this is a theoretical compound because it's not real in real life. So I began by observing that here we have three carbon-carbon double bonds. However, when we look at the structures, here we have one carbon-carbon double bond, and here we have two carbon-carbon double bonds. So if I want to know the enthalpy for the combustion of one carbon-carbon double bond, I will get the difference between these two. Because this has two, that has one, to get the enthalpy for one carbon-carbon double bond, 
I get the difference between the two. So uh, I say the one with two minus the one with one gives me that. So that is the enthalpy required to break apart one carbon-carbon double bond. And since I have that for one carbon-carbon double bond, I just added it on two, the one that has two, in order to generate that for that. Remember, this one has two carbon-carbon double bonds. If I want to find the one for three, just get the one carbon-carbon double bond, add it to the one with two carbon-carbon double bonds, then you can get it. So in the end, I say it's going to be the enthalpy uh, for cyclohexa 1,4-diene and the enthalpy for the combustion of one carbon-carbon double bond, which is that and that, giving me negative 3,416 kilojoules per mole. I will continue to the next part. It says, explain the differences between the enthalpy of combustion of cyclohexa 135 triene calculated in A1 and the enthalpy of combustion of benzene given in the table. Here, what we need to know is if we have to find the difference between the two in order to establish which one is more stable. So I got the one we have calculated minus that of benzene gives us a negative 149 kilojoules per mole. And since this is going to be uh, the value, which is this basically the amount of benzene or energy released from benzene is kind of, let me take you back to the table again to show you as I explain. This is from benzene. You can see it's going to be uh, lower in comparison to that we have calculated here. It means benzene is going to be more stable. Again, to take you back, benzene is going to be more stable by this amount in comparison to the cyclohexa 135 triene. And this stability is going to be caused because in benzene, the pi electrons are going to be delocalized around the ring, while in the theoretical one structure, which is the cyclohexa 135 triene, there is no delocalization of the pi electrons, and therefore the ring is not that stable in comparison. The, the, the structure is not that stable in comparison to the benzene ring. And lastly, here they say uh, bromine reacts with cyclohexene to form 1,2-dibromocyclohexene and with benzene to form bromobenzene. Uh, so they say compare and contrast these reactions considering the type and mechanism of each reaction and conditions required. So they say you are not required to draw the mechanism of the reaction. So I began by looking at the similarities when they say compare and contrast. They want you to discuss the similarities and differences. So for similarities, both are in, involve electrophilic attacks or they electrophiles. The carbon-carbon double bonds in uh, uh, the, the cyclohexene are going to be attacked by the electrophile. And in both, the mechanism leads to formation of a carbocation. The differences they have is with benzene, the reaction is a substitution reaction, while with the cyclohexene, the reaction is an addition reaction. So you know in this addition reaction, the carbon-carbon double bond will disappear. And then the reaction with bromine uh, or bromine with benzene require a catalyst. You remember the halogen carrier. It could be aluminum, aluminum bromide or so on. And then we need to heat while the cyclohexene conditions can be normal lab conditions without the need for a catalyst or need for heating. So I will go to the next part. Bromine also reacts with phenol. Identify by name or formula the organic compound when phenol reacts with excess bromine. Phenol has an oxygen hydrogen, and this oxygen has a lone pair. This lone pair gets incorporated into the ring, making it uh, easily attacked by electrophiles. And when substitution reactions occur, they occur on carbon 2, carbon 4, and carbon 6. In this case, the structure I wrote is the 246 tribromophenol, which is this one here. So the next question says, explain why bromine reacts much faster with phenol than with benzene. So remember, this is bromine. Why is it faster than uh, faster with phenol than the other? Again, this I'm going to refer you to the structure I've drawn here and the explanation I use. Remember, in phenol, there is a lone pair on the oxygen-hydrogen. So the OH, oxygen atom, has a lone pair, or two lone pairs, actually. So the lone pair can get incorporated into the ring, basically. It can't, gets incorporated with the pi electrons of the ring, and this is going to cause the electron density of the ring to be increased, making the structure of the phenol more susceptible to electrophilic attack in comparison to just benzene. And that susceptibility makes the reactions to proceed faster in comparison to uh, with uh, benzene, basically. 
So this brings us to the end of section B. Thank you for being with us and uh, hope to see you in our next video. I'm going to put in the description box a link to the section A as well as section C of this video. See you next time. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. Bye-bye.